I'm here with Abby Kearns, who's now Executive Director of the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Hey, Abby. Hi, Alex. Thank you. Oh, man. That's so exciting. I'm so excited for you. you you've you come on from Pivotal, and you really have like helped the Cloud Foundry Foundation establish itself over these past two years with Sam in charge, and now Sam is moving on. Sam's moving on to Google, which is quite something, and you are now left with the reins. You're taking the reins. You're you're going to now be able to really, you know, take Cloud Foundry into this next era. And I'm just wanting to know, what is that next era? I mean, it's a continuation, of course, but what is it that is now 2017? What is 2018? What is, what is kind of the story that is going to unfold here? Well, I think you'll see a continuation on all of the amazing foundational aspects that have been laid the last two years. So we will be continuing on the the story and the narrative around Cloud Foundry, how it is the industry leading cloud application platform, and we'll continue to talk about its multi-cloud capabilities and the portability of application workloads. But you'll also see us bringing on an additional thread which is really focusing on the developers a bit more than we have been in the past. So that's going to be a new push for us in 2017, is building up the, the developer community, building up the developer messaging, and talking about how developers are really going to be leading the charge as global 2000 organizations are shifting to become much more digitally native. So digitally native and Fortune 2000 companies and software development and there's a microservices surge happening there's all these there's open source ecosystems that are in play there's lots there's there's lots of factors and there's also very lots of different other kinds of um, ecosystems that are emerging right we have kubernetes we have mesos and so i'm wondering how Cloud Foundry will evolve as a platform, you know, uh, you know, for developers. What will the story be for the, you know, is the, you know, is your service platform going to be, the, you know, the, the big story here, the uh, um, service broker, um, you know, is that the big story for Cloud Foundry Foundation? Is that how is that how the platform will scale out, um, is, or is it something else? I think services are going to be huge. You know, as you talked about, the Cloud Foundry Service Broker API is a phenomenal way to connect services to the platform. And services are crucial to the success of any platform. Having the ability to connect to and leverage services as you build out applications, because at the end of the day, you can't create applications without the availability of services being database, messaging, um, application performance management, a whole litany of services that are relevant and necessary in order to run and manage your applications at scale. And so as we think about the, the need for services, we look to accelerating and building out the ecosystem around Cloud Foundry. And we have pinned that on the Cloud Foundry Service Broker API. And it turns out that it's such a elegant solution to connecting services to a platform that we're turning that into an industry leading specification. So an industry wide specification that will be leveraged by other communities and other platforms to allow a broad array of services to write against a single API and have their service accessible across many platforms. And so looking at it, the services from the ecosystem from that perspective, but then you know, looking at building out the capabilities and the supportability for developers and ensuring that they're able to quickly and easily deploy applications to production and leverage a broad array of services easily through that platform. 
Cloud Foundry at the end of the day's goal is to make writing and deploying and managing applications at scale as simple as possible. That's the ultimate vision. And so what that translates into for the Global 2000 is the ability to leverage that technology to enable their business transformation. It, when these organizations are looking to become software companies, as so many of them are, are now using, they're calling themselves software companies and they're like, I'm gonna be a software company. And what does that mean? That means obviously writing their own software and iterating on that software, but it also means changing the fundamentals of your business leveraging CICD capabilities, becoming more agile, driving a deeper connection with your customers in a way that you hadn't before. It just fundamentally changes not only your entire business model, but the way you in interact and engage with your end users. So how, how you, know, as, you know, as the new executive director of the Cloud Foundry Foundation, how will you uh, treat the service broker itself? How will it be defined? Will it be defined under the Cloud Foundry Foundation or will it be defined in a different manner? It will be under the Cloud Foundry Foundation. And um, it'll be offered up to allow other communities to participate, but will remain under the Cloud Foundry Foundation umbrella. Okay, so how will you then treat contributions and commits then to that? Will, will the ones who commit to it have to go through the certification, or will there be other requirements that, that make it for uh, contributing to the community around the service broker? No, what's so exciting is we were able to put it in its own PMC, a project management council. And under that framework, we're able to allow a broad array of developers to participate and commit to that. You don't have to be a member of the Cloud Foundry Foundation or, or an employee of an organization that's a member. It's, we've, opened it, we've set it aside in a way to allow that accessibility by a broader range of ecosystems. Because at the end of the day, we want more people to participate in iterating and developing and making that an industry specification, an industry standard on how you connect services to a platform. And so we're wanting to really open that up and make that accessible to many. And building on the success that Cloud Foundry continues to leverage on the availability of services against Cloud Foundry. So, so, how, so tell me how like, someone might participate in, in helping develop the service broker. Where will the, where will the work be done? Will it be done in GitHub? Will it be done in a private repository? Will it be done, uh, you know, how will, it be, how will people actually contribute? GitHub. It will be all be in GitHub. Yep. It's and so there. anyone can go in and, and contribute to the project. Then. You can go and you can submit pull request or you can join. We have a core group of committers and, um, that are, are there and managing it across a lot of different organizations. So how many, so you have, you'll have maintainers for the project? Then. Yes. How many will you have? Um, initially, I think we're at eight. And who are they? They are a mix from a variety of companies. Pivotal, it, obviously, um, IBM, Google, Fujitsu, and a few others that are looking to participate and be that core group that will continue to, to drive and iterate on the, the new features and functionality but we'll still allow pull request um, to come in and be managed by that group. So who, will there be uh, a project manager who is maybe independent of a, of a large company? Right now, no. We, uh, the project manager is part of the existing. So, yeah, so they'll be the maintainers, they'll be the ones who are deciding what, 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 what uh, gets committed and what does not. Right now, yes, that will probably evolve over time. But given the success we've had with the Service Broker API to date and the criticality of it to the Cloud Foundry ecosystem, um, there is obviously um, a great deal of visibility on making that even more successful. Are these, how are you going to, you know, um, a focus uh, that we're looking at with open source communities is their diversity, right, and their inclusion. 
uh, how are you doing that? How, do you, how are you going to approach that with like you know, the service broker uh, you know, community? Well, by setting it up and allowing the committers to not have to already be part of the, the foundation or already be part of the community, our hope is to be inclusive and open that up and make that easy and accessible for anyone that either wants to actively participate or participate in one-off manner where they're like, hey, you know what, this is great, but wouldn't this be even better if we had this one capability and submit a PR or something like that. But our goal is to make this as inclusive as possible and ensure that everyone is able to participate equally and continuing to iterate on the API standard. Now I'll say that it is a standard. And, and as, as such, or maybe I'll, a better phrase is it's a specification. It's an API specification. So as such, we won't expect it to change that quickly um, and that much. Change will probably be incremental because it is a, a very, um, because it's the nature of specifications. They don't change quickly. Why are you guys defining it as a specification then? Because that's what it is. Yeah. Is there any other way you could approach it that you've considered? No, I mean, it's the goal is to take the API. It's very simple. The API itself is very simple. It creates, it's binds, just opening, unbinds, deletes, it's opening, right? just opening that API. Yeah, and so it's just the goal of establishing that as the, the specification allows there to be an agreement on what that API looks like. Yeah, I didn't know if there might be encompassing something more than that, but it seems like the specification is basically what you're needing to focus on. Yes. Right. Um, so the so the people have been building this have been you know the Cloud Foundry Foundation um, Chip Shoulders have been definitely involved. He's now he's now the he's now kind of the CTO, right? He's now named as CTO of the foundation itself. Yes, he's right? the CTO. And um, uh, so Chip's been I know heavily involved in it. Hey, um, who's been involved in building the service broker up to this point? The members have been involved in it. Who, who besides Chip would be? A, has been involved in developing it up to this point. Well, Chip hasn't really been involved in developing it. Been managing it. Yeah, Chip. Chip serves as CTO, which we're very excited to have Chip as part of the Cloud Foundry team. Um, the development around the Service Broker and the Service Broker API to this point has been the Cloud Foundry development team, and most of that, the bulk of that work, has been done by Pivotal. So I'd say that specifically. Um, Shannon Cohen and others have had a lot of of effort and the development to date and they've done a really great job of shepherding it and making it a specification that everyone that appeals to everyone and everyone is really interested in because it solved in, in an elegant way a problem which is connecting services to a platform making services easily and accessible to developers as they develop applications on a platform. Mm. And that's what's so exciting. It's like, you know, we're, we're talking about getting more developers and we talk a lot about cloud native application architectures and microservices and writing more code and, and iterating quickly. But at the end of the day, without services, you aren't able to, to do that and be successful because you, you need those services in order to provide the functionality for the applications. And so for us, services are as critical as getting the applications on board. And realistically, both serve as a two-sided network effect. Mm. Um, when I think about the viability of services and applications, I think about you know, the iPhone, because we sit here and look at our iPhones mm. right here, right? Um, what made the iPhone interesting? When it first came out, okay, I could take, I could text, I could take photos, I could talk on the phone. But as the, the App Store came out and more applications were available on the phone, it became much more crucial and much more critical. It's now, my phone for me is how I call Uber. It's how I have my boarding pass. It's how I check in for my flight. It's how I order groceries. It's how I order food delivery. It is a lot of different things to me the platform doesn't provide that, the phone doesn't provide that, the applications and the services available on that platform are what provide the value to me. And I th we think about Cloud Foundry, 
that's the way to think about it. Cloud Foundry is the phone. It's it is the iPhone, right? It is just that that simple, elegant abstraction. But by offering up a, a proliferation of applications that make it easy for you as an in, as a business to continue to engage with your customers, operationalize your business, you know, get more efficient, um, take data you already have and offer it up in a mobile app or things like that. That's what makes Cloud Foundry exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, with that in mind, how will the service broker serve, uh, you know, other communities? Like, what do you, what are you saying to other communities? I'm thinking specifically like a community like, uh, you know, the Kubernetes community, the Kubernetes ecosystem. How do you see your, how do you see the service broker in context with Kubernetes? Um, the service broker, the amazing thing about the service broker API is it is such an elegant solution for services that by making it a standard, making it a specification that's accessible by other platforms allows services, allows it to be used on platforms like Kubernetes and allows them the Kubernetes, the users that are leveraging Kubernetes to connect and bind with services as well. We think of this as a win for not just the, the users that potentially are running multiple platforms in an environment and want that portability for their services, but also for the ISVs, those companies that are developing services, developing software that is accessible by services. And we- Alex, you're here early. Hey, we're Sorry. doing an interview. Sorry about that. Come on in. It's fine. Oh, there you go. thank you. Can we leave you alone for a minute? Yeah, well, we'll I'll be ready in five, about five, ten minutes. Sounds good. Great. That was Sam Ranji stopping, dropping off uh, work rules. Yep. It will transform how you live and lead. So that, so that's the philosophy behind the service broker. Really, is to be that 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 integrated kind of you can provide the integrated capability for services to service discovery kind of on a platform like Kubernetes and how they adopt it, we'll see, you know, or how users will adopt it, we'll see. But more than that, it makes it easier for, like I said, software vendors to develop services and make them accessible. If you, if you're, and I, and I think particularly of smaller so ISVs, smaller software companies, right? That are, that are writing and developing software and they want to make it accessible to someone that's running their application on a platform. Isn't it an easier, an easier job for them to be able to write against a single API and have that service accessible across a variety of platforms? Mm. I mean, for them, that makes their life easier. Mm. They're not having to customize their software for each individual platform. And so by making that leap and by making that accessibility for services, we now allow them to offer services and offer a broader array of services across a variety of platforms and building and accelerating that ecosystem irrespective of the underlying platform. Mm -hmm. So as we talk about what Cloud Foundry has brought to the table to date, Cloud Foundry offers the ability to run your apps consistently with the same experience irrespective of the underlying cloud and the underlying IaaS, mm -hmm. right? So that, that was step one, is offering that accessibility and that portability to organizations so that they can run on AWS, on Google, on Azure, on OpenStack, on VMware, on unikernels, they have that availability. Mm. And as we talk about doing the same for services, we that really allows us to change the game. What is an ecosystem? What is the value of that ecosystem? How does that morph what that perspective is, not only for the services, but also for the organizations that are looking to develop new ways of engaging with their own user base. So in 2017, how do you see um, uh, the ecosystem becoming more diverse? So, uh, so we see more, you know, for instance, young companies that are, um, you know, have they, they have that opportunity to be, you know, very innovative because they're just young and they're starting off with a new idea. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, growth in the Kubernetes community with startups, you know, that we see. Um, how does cloud? How do you want to approach kind of that with the Cloud Foundry Foundation the next year? How do you want to like create this, you know, this kind of this rich, 
this rich mix of uh, you know young innovators. I think that's an exciting challenge. I mean, the startup community has long held the domain of innovation. You know, companies that weren't here three months ago are all of a sudden now taking on enterprises. Um, the ability to create new technologies and new ways of solving problems in your basement or your garage, that, that's long been a stalwart of the startup community. But I also think, as we're starting to see a lot of these larger organizations, the Fortune 500, the Global 2000, wanting to leverage platforms like Cloud Foundry to really transform their business and transform the way that they think about technology, I think we'll st we're starting to see innovation rise up in those organizations as well. And I am super excited for the next couple of years as more and more of these organizations are really transforming the way that they write software, what software they write, how do they engage, how do they leverage the data that they've got and really expose that in new and interesting ways to their user base. I think we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg for that. And I think it's gonna be really interesting to watch the innovation that comes from these organizations. And um, We'll still have the innovation that springs up from these startups and, and how they're going to continue to push the envelope. But I'm also looking forward to the response from these larger organizations that are also looking to innovate and leverage a lot of those leaps, as well as establishing broader innovation challenges within their own organizations. So Google recently joined, right, you know, uh, joined in its support of, of Cloud Boundary. And um, now they are, you know, you know, now they're kind of moving forward with kind of their own strategy. We haven't caught up with them for a while, but we probably should. Um, what is the relationship with, you know, with Google going forward? Sam's going there now, and so he'll be, you know, overseeing lots of different things related to Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes and everything else. Curious about the relationship going forward. I think it's going to be an exciting one. Google is investing quite a bit in the enterprise space and investing quite a bit in establishing Google Cloud Platform as the, the platform of choice for the enterprises, um, particularly those that are looking to invest heavily in the public cloud. And I think, you know, we all know Google has the breadth and uh, the depth in terms of R&D and investments they can make. And I think with them wanting to leverage Cloud Foundry, um, you know, obviously the announcement they had a few weeks ago about running Pivotal Cloud Foundry on GCP and the deep integrations there and making use of the services within Google. And the, you know, with bringing Sam over and continued investment in Cloud Foundry and joining the foundation and participating in the, the open service broker API work, I think it's just going to spell exciting times. Right. Like the proliferation of services, the ecosystem that is now accessible, the the adoption of Cloud Foundry and the deep ties there, I think it's just, I think the next couple of years are gonna be really exciting as this technology continues to unfold and iterate and open up new ways of developing and delivering technology. Well, Abby, congratulations again on this great, uh, you know, new uh, opportunity in your own career and uh, the opportunity for Cloud Foundry Foundation and the membership out there and all the people who you know, are developing and using it. This is uh, uh, kind of a very exciting time. So thanks for taking some time to talk. Uh, you know about you know about what's ahead. Well, thank you, Alex. It's always great to talk to you, and looking forward to having many more conversations about what we're working on and where we're going. I'm, I'm excited too. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks.